Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to the workshop. We've been working really hard this year to transform the entire backyard and this workshop. The Tough Shed went up in June and ever since then I've been sharing project tutorials on how to finish off the entire inside of this shed. I thought it would be nice to have all of the project tutorials in one video. It's definitely a long one, but if you're finishing off a shed or converting a garage space, this will be a great resource for you. I'm going to do a quick run through of the prep work that we did, the tough shed build and install, as well as all the DIY projects that we did to finish off the interior. There are timestamps below if you want to jump to certain DIY projects. Before each tutorial, I'm going to share the cost breakdown as well as the level of difficulty. Any links, products, or tools that I mentioned in the videos will be linked in the description below. Let's get into it, starting with the prep work. This is what our backyard looked like before. And this is the garage that I've been trying to work out of for the past couple of years. I needed a solution fast, and instead of trying to build a shed ourselves, we decided to go with a tough shed. To prep for the tough shed, we hired help to remove the existing old cracked concrete and pour new concrete. The concrete removal was about $900 and the new concrete pour for this entire area plus the shed foundation was about $5,500. You don't have to pour a concrete pad for your tough shed if you go with their shed option that has a floor, but in my opinion, I think the concrete foundation looks the most finished and professional. We added tons of new landscaping and sod. We did everything we could to get this area prepped while our shed was going through engineering, permitting, and prefabrication. We decided to go with a 16 by 22 foot Premier Pro Ranch garage. I was able to customize the entire shed to look just like a mini version of our house. I was able to match the same roof structure, windows and doors, colors of shingles, as well as the same exterior paint color. The install crew arrived right away in the morning, offloaded our kit from their trailers, and then got right to work. They assembled the walls in sections and then moved on to the trusses. I had the windows and doors ready in our garage waiting for them on install day. I was able to custom order those myself to match the same doors as our house and then they installed them for us. The install team was incredible to watch. Everyone had a specific job to do and they worked so smooth and fast together. I'm really happy we went this route with Tough Shed building the shell of the workshop. I was able to put more time and effort into finishing off the inside. No more than seven to eight hours later, these guys were completely finished. I couldn't believe it to be honest they wrapped up their final touches and cleaned the entire area leaving us with a big beautiful quality shed you can design your own at toughshed.com. I will also link the specific model that we went with in the description below. I did receive a small discount on my shed, but full price it would have been $20,500, and then the windows and doors cost us about $1,400. Now it's time to start working on projects inside the shed. The first DIY project that I tackled was insulation. I did spray foam insulation on the ceiling and bat insulation in the walls. Before insulation, we had an electrician come and help us wire everything up, so be sure to take care of the electrical and plumbing before doing insulation. To wire up the whole shed, that cost us about $3,500. I would say the level of difficulty for the spray foam insulation was medium, and the level of difficulty for the bat insulation was easy. All the insulation for this 352 square foot shed cost about $1,800. Let's get into the insulation tutorial. First, I'm covering the floor with plastic. This spray insulation is about to get very messy and this will make cleanup so much easier. I put plastic around the electrical panel and I should have also put plastic around the windows and doors because they ended up getting some overspray. It's best to cover anything you don't want to get spray foam on. I'll be using this 600 square foot handy foam spray insulation kit. The workshop is 352 square feet and I'm going to aim for two inches of coverage. I knew we'd be pushing it with only one pack, so I got an additional 200 square foot pack. Be sure you're wearing proper safety equipment. Everything should be covered and a proper mask should be worn. The temperature was mid 90s this day, which felt even hotter up high with the added layers. So it was very uncomfortable. If you do this for a living, you are amazing. I followed the setup instructions closely, tested out the spray in a cardboard box, and then got to spraying. We have scissor trusses and two x four framing. So like I mentioned, 
second. I'm only spraying about two inches. I ended up doing two coats of spray foam insulation, both coats about one inch thick. I found that having a tall ladder near the peak and a shorter ladder next to it worked pretty well. The scissor trusses came in handy because I was able to hang on to them as I sprayed for some extra security. My husband, Devin, helped me move the tanks and ladders around, and he also helped to point out areas that I missed or needed more product. Doing a tall ceiling like this, I definitely recommend having two people. You have to work pretty quick with this product. If you stop spraying for more than 30 seconds, the spray nozzle will clog with spray foam. They included a bunch of extra tips though, so if you need to pause for any reason or take a break, you can just replace the nozzle as needed. At the beginning, I tried to follow the same spray pattern, but with all the wiring, blocking, and just weird angles, it was impossible to keep a clean pattern, so I just did my best. I was able to do one and a half coats with the 600 square foot kit and then with the 200 square foot kit I finished up the second coat then sprayed the two vaulted ends and the gaps along the ridge in the center. It's not pretty but it'll do the trick and we saved a ton of money doing this ourselves. Before doing the bat insulation, I thought I would seal around the windows, doors, and any other penetrations. Be sure to use a sealant foam that's meant for windows and doors. I also used some great stuff to seal any areas that I might have missed above the top plate. After all the spray foam was dried, I went around with a 5-in-1 tool and scraped any spray foam off that will get in the way of drywall. Now we can insulate the walls. I'm using R13 bat insulation on the walls. This is craft faced, so it has a paper facing, which means we don't need to cover it with a plastic vapor barrier. This package comes with 11 pieces that are 15 inches wide and 93 inches long, which fit perfectly in between our 16 inch on center studs. Make sure you're wearing proper protective equipment. I should have had my arms and legs covered safety glasses and a mask on at all times, but it was over 100 degrees in here and that advice was very difficult to follow, so do as I say, not as I do. I used a folding table so that I could easily cut pieces down to size. I used a regular utility blade, but a longer blade or insulation knife would have worked much better. I also used a four foot level as my straight edge and a permanent marker to mark out any measurements. This insulation has tabs on each side that fold out and overlap over the studs. After the insulation is installed, I'll go back and staple those tabs to the studs. For the outlets or switches, I set the insulation next to the opening, marked out where the outlet is on the insulation, and then cut out an opening for the outlets. From that cutout, I took a bit of it and placed it behind the outlet. As you can see where I run into electrical wires, I'm splitting the insulation and then tucking about half of it behind the wiring and then placing the other half over top. Now that all the insulation is in, I'm going back and stapling the tabs of the insulation to the studs every six to eight inches. I made sure to overlap the tabs so that no studs were exposed where possible. I used an electric multi-tacker for this project which helped it go a lot faster. I'll link that in the description below. There you have my take on DIY insulation. It's not perfect, there are most likely some inefficiencies, but we saved a lot of money doing this ourselves and I learned a new skill. 
The next project on the list is hanging drywall, taping, and mudding. The level of difficulty for hanging drywall, I would say is medium. And for the taping and mudding process, I would say that is hard. Overall, our drywall and mudding supplies cost about $380. I am not a professional drywaller by any means, especially mudding. There's definitely an art to it and it takes a while to get the hang of it. But if you're trying to save some money or like me doing drywall in a shed where a few imperfections don't really make a difference, I definitely recommend trying to do it yourself. I broke everything down that I learned as a beginner drywaller. I even made a drywall and mudding cheat sheet that's linked below. Let's start hanging some drywall. First step is ordering materials and gathering the right tools. If you need help calculating the amount of drywall required for your project, Home Depot's website has a drywall calculator tool. You can input your dimensions and it will tell you how much drywall you need and will even factor in 10% extra in case of bad cuts or breaks. We're using half inch drywall, which is most common for walls and ceilings. We ordered all our material through Home Depot and just had everything delivered right to the house, which was definitely the right move. If you're having everything delivered you might as well throw in the drywall screws, joint compound, taping material, and any additional tools that you may need. We used the very basic beginner tools for this project, which you can find in the description below. Before hanging drywall, some prep work is required. Go around the room to make sure any staples, nails, or screws aren't sticking out of the framing and to ensure no insulation is in the way. If you need to add any additional blocking, now's the time to do it. Make sure your drywall has a place to start and stop on a stud or backing. Lastly, make sure electrical wires and plumbing lines are covered with nail plates where required. Next step is to determine the layout for your drywall. You want to use the largest pieces possible to minimize the amount of seams. Your drywall has to start and stop on a stud, so measure accordingly. If you need to drywall the ceiling, that's where you should start. We're doing tongue and groove on the ceiling, so we're going to install that after the drywall is finished on the walls. Stagger all vertical joints. This helps to improve the strength of your walls. Place any seams over windows and doors in the middle of the opening instead of at the corners to prevent cracking. Leave a half inch gap or so at the floor. You don't want drywall touching the floor to prevent moisture or water damage. A foot lift or spacers can help with this. The two long sides of the drywall are tapered. This beveled edge is an eighth inch thinner than the rest of the drywall. Always place beveled edges next to each other. Whenever possible, place your cut edges against the corners where they'll be covered by trim or another piece of drywall. Typically, it's best to hang the top row first and then the bottom row. Before hanging drywall, mark on the subfloor or on the top plate the locations of each stud. This will help out when you're marking out your nailing or screwing pattern on the drywall. For each wall, snap a chalk line so that you have a level line as a guide to place your first row of drywall. If you're starting at the top, make sure you're accounting for that half inch gap at the floor. Now into cutting drywall. For cutting drywall, we're just using basic tools, a drywall T-square and utility blade. To cut the drywall, take your measurement from a square end, place your drywall T-square edge on the line and use the utility blade to score the front side of the drywall. If you're only scoring the front side, you don't need to cut all the way through. Score the front side, snap it, then cut the paper backing. You may want to smooth the rough edges with a rasp to achieve tight joints. Cut overall lengths about a quarter inch shorter for easier fitting. For hanging drywall, you want to align the first row of drywall with your level chalk line. If you're using half inch drywall, secure a few one and a quarter inch drywall screws to hold it in place. There is a power tool called a drywall drill which makes screwing off the drywall faster and easier. However, we opted to use a drill and a drywall bit. This bit ensures you don't overdrive, you don't want to puncture the drywall paper, and this bit sets the screws at the perfect depth. Take your drywall T-square and mark out the center of your studs where the screws need to go. You should have screws on every stud about 12 inches apart and about 8 inches apart around the edges. Hold off on screwing the drywall at the cut edges that meet along the length of the stud until both pieces are hung. This is to prevent any blowout from hindering the positioning of the next piece. The joint of the drywall along the length of the stud is called a butt joint. 
For cutting out around outlets, switches, doors, windows, fixtures, we used a drywall jab saw. If you have a lot of cuts, you may want to consider a rotary cutout tool. Cut the drywall to fit around electrical boxes and fixtures, plumbing rough ends, etc. Determine to the nearest eighth of an inch the horizontal measurements on the wall to the box location. Mark the exact location on the face of the drywall. Using a drywall square or speed square and a pencil, transfer these marks to the face of the drywall. For your vertical dimensions, do not measure up from the floor. Instead, measure down from the bottom of the drywall that you've already hung. Transfer this measurement, measuring from the top down. Double check your measurements, then use the tip of the jab saw to puncture all the way through the drywall and cut out your fixtures. When hanging the bottom row, use a drywall foot lift or blocking to lift your drywall in place. To cut out windows and doors, hang your drywall directly over the window or the door, secure plenty of screws to the framing around the window or door, and then use your saw to cut them out using the window framing or door framing as a guide. We had to add some additional blocking at the gable ends here. We also added some backing for the mini split unit while we were at it. The drywall is finished. Now let's move on to the not so fun part, taping and mudding. Check out the cheat sheet below for the link to the basic tools and materials that we used. I had a bin of old drywall tools in the garage from my dad and I'm finally putting them to use. Here I have a mud pan, but you can also use a hawk. I have six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, and 12 inch mudding knives. Here's a mixer for the joint compound, drywall joint tape. This is all purpose joint compound. We used this to embed the tape. This is plus three joint compound for the finish coats and then Easy Sand 90 or Easy Sand 45 for filling any large gaps or holes over a quarter inch. You'll also need a drill for mixing the compound and a bucket of water to keep your tools clean. Before mudding, we need to do a little prep work. Go around and set in any screws that aren't in all the way. Again, a reminder not to drive the screws in too far. If there are any raised bits of drywall at the seams, dent it in so you can fill it with mud. You'll want to plastic your floor because it's about to get very messy. If you're mudding the ceiling or you have tall walls, consider renting a scaffolding. Full disclosure, there are a lot of other great videos out there to demonstrate technique. Mudding is an art and it takes a lot of practice and I don't do this all the time. You can watch all the videos in the world but nothing is quite like actually throwing mud on the wall and just trying things out until you find what works. You may want to consider pre-cutting some eight foot sections of drywall tape for easier handling. Keep a bucket of water close by so you can clean your tools or hands when needed. You always want to keep any dried mud or dust away from your clean mud so it's best to clean your tools and your mud bucket as you go. I kept my mixer right in the bucket of water so it didn't dry out. Step one, pre-fill any gaps or holes that are larger than a quarter of an inch. If you have any large gaps, it's best to go through and fill those first with a fast drying compound like this Easy Sand 90 or Easy Sand 45. You could use an all-purpose mix, but it's going to take a lot longer for your mud to dry. After you've pre-filled the large gaps and holes with a six inch knife, wait for the mud to dry according to the instructions and then you can move on to the next step. Step two, bedding the tape. There's a lot of different strategies out there as to the order of how to do things. We're going to start with the tapered horizontal joints, inside corners, and finish with butt joints. If we had any outside corners, we would have done them last. Screw indentations are the easiest to fill, which can be done as you work past them. 
Next, it's time to mix our mud. For this step, I'm using an all-purpose joint compound. As a beginner, I find this works best instead of trying to mix my own compound. For the step of bedding your tape, it's okay for your mud to be a little bit thicker. In fact, I found it easier to work with this way when it's not sliding all over the place. You have to be very careful with the consistency of your mud though. If you start taping and you notice your tape is bubbling or blistering, it's most likely because your mud is too dry, so just keep an eye out. I'm adding a bit of water to the mud like the instructions say and mixing it thoroughly. I found it easier to mix mud and a little bit of water right in the pan as I go. I added just enough water to see a slight change in the consistency. For this first coat of bedding the tape, I'm using a six inch knife and a mud pan. You could also use a hawk, but I think this is easier and more manageable as a beginner. Let's do the tapered joints first. The tapered joints are where the two long beveled edges of the drywall meet. There's going to be a dip here, so you want to fill the joint with a decent amount of mud. Then go over and spread the mud evenly over the joint. Center your tape over the seam. Gently go over the tape with your knife to set the tape and to scrape out any excess. You don't need to apply a ton of pressure and be sure to keep your knife angled. I found it worked best to go over the tape one more time with another light coat of mud to wet the tape. You want to keep your mud edges nice and clean so to feather them out, apply pressure to the outside edge of your trowel as you run it along the top and bottom side of the joint. Next are inside corners, which I found to be very tricky. You'll want to pre-cut and pre-crease your tape so it's all ready. With your six inch knife, apply mud to each side of the corner. Spread the mud out a bit and then set your creased tape and gently scrape out any excess. On one side at a time, wet the tape with mud again after it's been set. Just like before, keep the edges of the mud nice and clean by feathering it out. Butt joints are next. Butt joints are the vertical joints that run along a single stud. You will want these joints to be as clean as possible with no extra mud. This is because these joints are not beveled. The tape and mud add additional material to the face of the drywall, so we only want to apply a thin coat of mud to set the tape. There is mixed reviews on overlapping your tape. Most say don't overlap because it's adding extra buildup and then wet the tape one more time with a very light coat on top. When going over the tape, apply a bit more pressure to your knife to wipe out any excess mud. Next are outside corners. Unfortunately and fortunately, I don't have any outside corners to demonstrate with, but these would be taken care of last. For the screw indentations, go over all of these with your six inch knife. You don't have to worry about covering the holes that will be covered by baseboard trim or window and door trim. Be sure to scrape away any excess mud. Step three is to scrape off bumps and ridges. Make sure you read the dry time on your joint compound. Dry time may vary depending on temperature and humidity. This mud we're using takes about 24 hours to dry completely. Once everything is dry and before starting the next coat, we need to go around and scrape any ridges, bumps, or high spots. Just use a sharp 6 inch or 8 inch knife and go around the whole room to knock down any high spots. If you start scraping and you gouge the mud because it's still soft, you need to wait longer for it to dry. Now that everything is scraped down, we can apply our second coat of mud. I'll be using an eight inch knife and the plus three joint compound. This compound is lighter than the all purpose compound and we're still going to add a tiny bit of water. I like to start on one side of the inside corner, then do the taper joints, 
the butt joints, screw indentations, and then come back to the other side of the corner. You could also wait until the next day to do the second side of the corner to prevent gouging the wet mud, but I don't have the patience for that. For the second and third coats, we're not using a lot of joint compound. These steps are all about feathering out the joints a few more inches, making sure all your edges stay nice and clean. For butt joints specifically, you don't want to be adding extra mud to the center of the joint. The goal is to feather out each side since the center is already raised with tape. With your eight inch knife, feather it out eight inches on either side of the joint. For your third coat of mud, follow the same step as before using a longer knife. Once again, the goal is to feather out the previous coat even more. For this coat, we used the same plus three joint compound. Take your 10 inch knife and place it over the mudded joint. If there are still any high spots or low spots, you can apply additional coats as needed. We did one last coat using a 12 inch knife. You do not need to do a six, eight, 10, 12 inch knife. However, you should always finish with the widest knife that you're comfortable with, like a 12 or 14 inch knife. Once our tongue and groove was installed on the ceiling, I went back and mudded the top beveled edge to eliminate the gap in between the drywall and tongue and groove board. After your final coat of mud is dry, you can sand. You can do it close up using the sanding blocks or you can use these pole sanders with different attachments. Run your sanding block or pole sander over all the joints to get a smooth surface with no lines between the edge of the compound and the drywall and with no ridges or pinholes. Be sure to wear protective equipment. This will produce a ridiculous amount of dust, so be safe. Now it's time to get everything cleaned up and we can start priming and painting the walls. There are different levels of drywall finish. If you're doing an unfinished garage or workshop, you could get away with a level one or two finish. We're doing a fancy workshop and our goal was to achieve a level four finish with no texture needed. As a test, you can take your 12 inch knife and place it perpendicular over the joints to see if the mud is level. If your knife rocks, you have too much buildup. I'm gonna be honest, I thought we did a pretty bad job, but after sanding and inspecting everything, I would give us a nine out of 10. We probably added a bit too much mud, which required some extra sanding, but the result is pretty amazing. We don't need to add any extra texture, so I think we easily achieved that level four finish. You've already seen a bit of a sneak peek. Next up, we'll be installing shiplap on the ceiling and installing a mini split system, so you can look forward to those projects next. Before we move on to the next project, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Aquar. A few years ago, I installed the Aquar House Hydrant V1 Plus. It's a beautiful, durable, low profile water outlet for your home. With this, you don't have to worry about leaks or drips, and you don't have to deal with the hassles of threading on your garden hoses. I installed this through our concrete wall, so I got the eight inch length. They have different sizes depending on the thickness of your wall. They also have different finishes for the cover. I went with the brush stainless. I'm also using their comfort grip connector and their 25 foot ultralight garden hose. This is a marine grade stainless steel valve that lets you access water instantly anytime you need it. Just plug in the hose connector and water turns on automatically. I love the sleek and minimalist appearance and all it takes is a simple twist to engage the house hydrant. Another great thing about this hydrant is its sub-zero freeze protection. It self drains upon disconnection so when it comes to winterize your home there's no need to worry about freezing pipes. Thanks again Aquar, you can find the link to their website in the description below. 
The next project is installing a Pioneer mini split system. I am not a licensed electrician or HVAC specialist. My husband and I installed this system for the first time ourselves. So this video is based off how to install a mini split system from a DIYer perspective. The price of our mini split was about $750. We did have to buy a few specialty tools and equipment. So all in all, I think we spent about $1,000 on the mini split installation. I would say the level of difficulty for this project is hard. This is one that I would maybe recommend hiring out, but if you're brave and can follow instructions really well, definitely go for it and do it yourself. Let's install this mini split. Before we begin, I want to touch on the very first step, which is electrical. We sent the unit specifications to our electrician and he pre-wired everything for us. This unit is part of Pioneer's Diamante series. The Diamante series carries a full line of low ambient wall mounted mini splits with capacities ranging from 9,000 BTUs to 36,000 BTUs for various residential and light commercial applications. This product's main advantages lie in its high durability, excellent energy efficiency, and cost effectiveness, which can lead to considerable savings. We are starting with the indoor unit. On the back of the indoor unit, you'll find the mounting plate, which you'll want to remove. We planned the location of this unit before hanging drywall, so we were able to add some blocking for the mini split. With this blocking in place, we were able to secure the mounting plate right into the blocking. If you don't have any blocking, drywall anchors are provided. Be sure to take into account the minimum clearance requirements found in your instruction manual. Secure the bracket nice and level. With your mounting plate secured, the next step is drilling a hole for the connective piping. We are positioning the outdoor unit directly below the indoor unit, so we decided to drill the hole in the bottom right corner if you're looking at the front of the unit which is one of the suggested locations. The piping can also exit from behind the unit on the left side. If you have something hindering either of these positions for the hole, you can drill a hole on the outside of the unit on the left or right side by removing the left slash right plastic knockout panels. Place the indoor unit on the bracket and trace out the corner of the unit nearest where the hole will be drilled, in our case, the bottom right corner. This is to verify the location of the hole that you'll be drilling. We used a two and a half inch hole saw bit to drill the hole. Ensure the hole is angled downwards to the exterior to allow for proper drainage. We started the hole on the interior of the shed and then drilled all the way through from the exterior. Next, we prepared the copper lines. We carefully bent and formed the lines so they'll be able to go out the hole that we drilled. When bending the pipes, be careful not to crimp the lines. Now it's time to make the electrical connections. Make sure to follow the diagram on the front of the unit. You can match number to number or reference the diagram to connect the cables. You can connect the copper pipes to the indoor unit now, but we found it easier to put the unit on the wall first, then connect the pipes from the outside of the shed. This way we only had to thread about one foot of pipe through the two and a half inch hole rather than 16 feet of pipe. Carefully lift the unit in place and run the pipes, cable, and drain hose out through the hole and then push on the lower part of the unit so it clicks into the mounting plate. Before mounting the indoor unit, it's a good idea to wrap the lines with the insulated material provided and and tape so they stay in a tight bundle. Thank you. 
Next, we prepped the location for the outdoor unit. Be sure to choose an appropriate location following the installation guidelines. We cleared the gravel and leveled the ground so we could set two large pavers down as our base. With the outdoor unit set in place, we uncovered the service ports. We carefully unrolled the copper pipe. It's important to unwind the pipe gently rather than pull from both ends. Once unwound, bring the ends of the copper line and the end of the indoor unit line together. Remove the indoor unit piping cap. You may hear some nitrogen gas escape. Our kit came with a package of flare gaskets and leak sealant. Use the leak sealant on the flares of the piping and attach the flare gasket. Tighten as much as possible by hand. Use the torque guide provided to tighten to specifications. The next step is to flare the pipe ends. The end of our pipes were already flared, but we needed to cut the pipe down to shorten the line. One, to clean up the look on the outside of the shed, and two, to improve the efficiency. It's not recommended to leave extra pipe coiled. For this step, you'll need a copper pipe cutter, flaring tool, reamer, and some sealant. When cutting the copper pipe, be sure not to crimp the tube. Turn the knob on the cutter about a quarter turn every few rotations until the cut is complete. Make sure your cut is at 90 degrees. Use the reamer to clean up any imperfections or burrs that may have appeared during the cutting process. Hold the pipe downward to prevent burrs from falling into the pipe. Next, use the flaring tool. Prior to flaring, it is very important to put the flare nut on the copper pipe and ensure it's on the correct way. With the flare nut on the copper pipe, use the flaring tool as explained in the directions. Ensure the pipe is only out 1 32nd to 1 16th of an inch and in the correct size guide. Once all lined up, you can flare the pipe. Proper flaring is essential to achieve an airtight seal. If you flare it too much, you'll bust the flare and not flaring enough won't create a tight seal. With the pipe flared, it's time to connect the pipes to the outdoor unit. Attach the pipes to the outdoor unit in the same manner as you did to the indoor unit. Include the leak sealant and flare gasket. When connecting pipes, be careful not to use excessive torque or to deform the piping in any way.
The next step is to wire up the outdoor unit according to the wiring diagram. Then reattach the electrical service cover. The next step is air evacuation and bleeding the circuit. To do this, you will need a vacuum pump and manifold gauge, as well as a 5 16 adapter to connect to the outdoor unit. You can find these linked below. Hook up the pump as shown in the video. Connect the blue hose of the manifold gauge to the service port on the outdoor unit's three-way valve using the 5 16 adapter. Connect the yellow hose from the manifold gauge to the vacuum pump. Once hooked up correctly as shown, open the blue valve first, then turn the pump on. You'll see a negative draw on the gauge. Allow this to run for approximately 15 minutes. This should vacuum out the air and hold around negative 30 inches of mercury. After 15 minutes, close the blue valve and turn pump off. Let's sit for another 15 minutes or so. The needle should not move, meaning there are no leaks. If there is a rise in the system vacuum, it means there is a leak. Refer to the instruction manual for troubleshooting. Next, using a hex wrench on the two-way valve, open the valve and release the gas into the system until your gauge has a positive pressure value above zero. Then close the valve after about five seconds. Watch the pressure gauge for a few minutes to make sure there is no drop in pressure. If there is no drop in pressure, release the rest of the gas into the system by turning the hex wrench a quarter inch clockwise turn at a time until fully open.
next open the three-way valve until fully open. When opening the valves, turn the wrench until it comes into contact with the stopper. Don't try to force the valve open further. Put the caps back on and tighten using a torque wrench if needed. Now it's time to turn on the electricity and see if our hard work has paid off. Mini split. The unit is successfully running, so now we can cover these lines. Devin wrapped the lines with the tape provided. To fill the hole, he used some tight foam and he also sealed the hole with an exterior grade sealant. Last, he installed this decorative line cover, which hid everything really nice. You can find this kit linked below. We also wrapped up the cables and stapled them neatly to the shed. The workshop is air conditioned and we learned a new skill. It would have cost us about $900 to have someone install this unit for us, but we were able to successfully do it ourselves. Thank you guys for watching. If you're installing your own mini split, good luck. I hope this tutorial helps. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I have tons of great workshop projects coming up, so I'll see you in the next video. In this next tutorial, I'm going to walk you through how to install this tongue and groove board on the ceiling. This tutorial also applies if you're hanging it on your walls. The cost of this project was about $850, and I would say the level of difficulty is medium. You're definitely going to want an extra set of hands working on this project, especially working up high. Although it's a more expensive option compared to drywall, I think it elevates the space. I think it looks a little more high end, and I do think it's easier easier to install compared to drywall when you're having to tape and mud on the ceiling. So let's get into the tutorial on hanging tongue and groove board. This is the lumber that we're using. It has a beadboard pattern on one side or you could also use the flat side. The flat side does have a beveled corner but they do make tongue and groove boards with a square 90 degree edge which looks really crisp. We're sticking with the beadboard pattern. I think it goes with the cottage style that we're going for in here. We ordered our boards from Home Depot. These are about five and a half inches wide by 12 feet long. We had the board shipped right to the house which was convenient but we ended up having to exchange and hand pick Pick about a third of the boards because they were either too bowed or discolored or damaged so keep that in mind when ordering material. You can find the links to the tools and materials that we use in the description below. Let's install some tongue and groove board. There are a few things to consider before you start installing the boards. First make sure that your insulation, electrical, and plumbing are all finished. If you need to add any additional blocking, now is the time to do it. Pay close attention to where your boards will hit the ends at the adjacent walls. We had to add some blocking here at the gable ends. We also had to add some extra blocking around the light fixtures. We rented a scaffold for the week, which was a huge help. This is definitely a two person job, especially if you're using long 12 foot boards like us. You'll want to set up a cut station. We used a miter saw for end cuts, a table saw to rip down the first and last rows, and a jigsaw to cut out around electrical fixtures. To install the boards, we each had a brad nailer with one and a half inch brad nails. We had a rubber mallet and small scrap pieces of board to pound the boards into place without damaging the tongue. Once again, you can find the link to the tools that we used in the description below. First step is to measure out your rows and rip the first board down accordingly. Measure the entire side from the bottom to the top and calculate how many rows you'll need. You may need to rip down your first row so that you don't end up with a tiny sliver of a row at the peak or at the other end of your ceiling. 
We had to rip down our first row to about three inches. Here we made sure to cut off the grooved edge and not the tongue edge. Next, we snapped a line level with the center peak of the ceiling as a guide for our first row. If the first row is crooked, then you'll end up running into issues as you install the rest of the boards. We secured one nail on the bottom face of the board and one nail angled in the top tongue part of the board on every truss for this first row. To determine the length of the board, you need to measure to the center of your stud or truss so that each end of the board has something to secure a nail into. Before cutting your boards, check to make sure it's not extremely bowed or damaged. These boards will be near impossible to install or may create large gaps that aren't uniform with the rest of the boards. Be sure to square cut each end of the board before installing it. We decided to just square cut our boards, but you could also bevel your cut so that the end of your boards overlap and they create a really nice tight seam. Cut different board lengths each row so that all your seams are staggered, but try and use as much of the board as possible to avoid waste. But you'll want to secure brad nails angled at the tongue of the board here. Once you place the next board on top, the nails will be hidden. took some effort to get the longer boards in place. A lot of times just tapping the top of the board with a rubber mallet did the trick. If we needed to use more force, we used a hammer and a small scrap piece of board to pound the board into place. We only used one brad nail in the tongue at every truss. Sometimes we secured a few extra brad nails on the face of a stubborn bowed board if it needed some extra holding power. Once you get to a recessed light or electrical box, use your jigsaw to cut out the fixture. Cut the board to length first, dry fit it in place, and then measure and mark out where the fixture is. I used a paint can to trace a perfect circle, which is the same size as our recessed lighting. Using a jigsaw, I cut the circle out and then on the back of the board, I cut more of the groove so that it was easier to slide the board into place. We left a few rows open on the first side because we still need to install some mounts for our pendant fixtures at the peak. On the other side of the ceiling, we follow the same steps. If your ceiling isn't bolted like ours, you can just continue with your tongue and groove pattern. We took a measurement to the peak and then ripped down the first row accordingly. We snapped a level chalk line for our first row and then worked our way towards the peak just like before.
We have a vaulted ceiling and we'll be hanging pendant lights from the center of the vault. So we installed these special mounts, which I found on Amazon. These straddle the ceiling trusses and screw right into the two bys. The center pendant needs to be hung in between two ceiling trusses and so we had to cut some extra blocking to get the spacing that we needed. After the mounts were installed, we had to add some blocking around them so that we had something to secure the tongue and groove board to. We kept installing the boards towards the peak until we had two rows left, one row on each side. It took a bit of trial and error to figure out the angles at the peak. We ended up straight cutting one side of the tongue and groove board and then ripped down the other side at an angle to create a seamless transition. That is all on how to install tongue and groove board. Thank you guys for watching. In the next video, I'm going to be doing a whitewash treatment and finishing off the ceiling with some polyurethane, so stay tuned for that. Next up, I'm going to walk you guys through how to whitewash and the different techniques that I use to achieve this beautiful finish on our ceiling. In this tutorial, I'm also sharing how I painted all of the walls with a paint sprayer, and I also use my paint sprayer to polyurethane the ceilings. So all of that will be covered in this tutorial. Let's get into it. I tested out a ton of different stains. I've never had great luck staining pine. Even going through all the proper sanding and using a pre-stained wood conditioner, darker colors tend to still be blotchy, so I decided to keep things nice and light and stick to a whitewash. I did test a whitewash stain called Antique White by Verithane and it looked great, but they only sold the small quart-sized cans, so I decided to make my own whitewash with white paint. The paint that I'm using is just a flat white paint from Benjamin Moore. They recommended this Ultra Spec 500. I'm using a ratio of one part paint and one part water. I'm trying out a few different techniques here on the same unsanded tongue and groove board that's on the ceiling. To apply the whitewash, I'm using a large whitewash brush. For these first two boards here, I applied the whitewash and then wiped it off right away with a clean rag. For the next board, I applied the whitewash with the brush and left it. I didn't wipe it off at all. And then for the last board, I applied the whitewash with the brush, let it sit for a bit, and then wiped it off. Mm -hmm. 
I definitely recommend the first technique of brushing it on and then wiping it off right away. This leaves a nice soft finish without any harsh brush strokes. The next board where I waited to wipe off the whitewash, that looked good too, but it did leave the wood looking a little more white and lost some of that transparency. The last technique I don't recommend of brushing it on and not wiping it off, you can definitely see all the brush marks and it just doesn't finish as nice. Here's a piece of unfinished pine next to it for reference. With this ratio, I think that there's just enough white to take out the yellowness of the pine, but it's still transparent enough where you can see the character of the wood grain and knots. You just have to play around with the ratio until you achieve the look that you want. I've also seen people use paint thinner instead of water, so that's an option too. Whatever you decide to go with, just make sure you're mixing the same ratio every time. If you are whitewashing directly on your walls or ceiling like me, you'll want to tape off fixtures and plastic off anything you don't want to get paint on. If you're working on the ceiling like me, you're going to have a lot of drips, so be prepared for that. It would have been 10 times easier to whitewash the boards prior to installing them, and I know I'm going to get a lot of comments on this, but if you're going to do this, you need to have enough space to store all the boards while they dry. We were mudding drywall and doing other things in the workshop, so we just didn't have the space for it. Applying the whitewash directly on the ceiling Ceiling just made sense for our situation. It may be a bit more inconvenient working up high, but to be honest, I think it saves time applying it this way. So I mixed half a gallon of white paint and half a gallon of water into a small bucket. Like I mentioned before, I'm applying the whitewash with a large brush and then wiping it off right away with a clean rag. I bought a big bag of painter's rags and made sure to have plenty of rags nearby. You'll want to switch out your rags often to wipe off the excess whitewash. I recently bought this portable scaffold and I love it. We found ourselves renting a scaffold too often from our home improvement store so we decided to just buy a small one. It folds down nice and compact and I love that it has a safety rail so I feel secure working up high. I'm actually just planning to use it as a storage shelf once the workshop is finished. I'll link this in the description below if you're interested. I found it worked best to work in about five or six foot sections, only doing about three boards at a time. I didn't want the whitewash to sit for too long before wiping it off, so working in smaller sections like this worked best. I also found that it worked best to only work within the same three or four boards going all the way down. If I overlapped any dried whitewash, then you could see white lap marks. To prevent lap marks, I only did a few boards at a time and worked fast through each row to maintain a wet edge. My arms and shoulders and neck were definitely burning through this entire application, but I made it through the whole ceiling. I went back and did some touch-ups on any seams that I may have missed. I also went over some of the more yellow boards one more time. There you have my whitewashing tips and tricks. In the next video, I'm going to be spraying on a coat of polyurethane to protect the ceiling and to give it a tiny bit of shine. I'm going to be spraying two coats of this fast drying water-based polyurethane from Bare. It leaves a crystal clear finish, which is important on whitewash. You don't want a polyurethane that's going to dry with a yellow tone. I decided to go with a satin finish, which leaves just a slight soft shine. I'm using my Wagner Control Pro 170 paint sprayer to apply the polyurethane with this 413 tip. Before spraying, I put plastic over all the windows and doors and other fixtures. I bought this portable scaffold from Lowe's, which was so helpful for this project. I was able to hold on to the safety rail with one hand, spray with the other, and then Devin was a trooper and rolled me around on the scaffold to get every inch of the ceiling. I'll link this scaffold below. Proper protective equipment is essential for spraying any poly, stain, or paint. It's very important to have safety glasses, a respirator mask, and gloves. You'll see that I have a bucket next to me. I kept a bucket of hot water nearby so that when I was done spraying or needed to take a break, I could just set the nozzle into the bucket of water and that kept the tip from drying out. We didn't do any sanding in between coats after one coat of polyurethane 
stain was applied. We waited for about an hour and then applied the second coat. We only needed two coats of poly. This will help to protect the wood and it gives the tongue and groove the perfect amount of shine. I think the poly softens the look of the whitewash a little bit and leaves a really nice finish. After the polyurethane was finished and dried, I prepped the walls for primer and paint. I taped plastic over all the windows, doors, outlets, and switches. I covered anything with plastic that I didn't want to get paint on. Devin also helped me to cover a majority of the ceiling. I wanted to make it so that I could quickly spray on the primer and paint and not have to worry about getting paint on anything. Prep work takes a little bit of time, but it's so worth it because priming and painting with the paint sprayer goes so fast and the finish looks very professional. Before priming, I went around and wiped down all the walls. I'm using this multi-purpose primer from Benjamin Moore, and for paint, I'm using this Regal Select Interior Paint from Benjamin Moore in the color Chantilly Lace and in an eggshell finish. The paint tip that I'm using for priming and painting is 517. I have my Wagner Control Pro 170 all set up with primer. I want to thank Wagner for sponsoring this video. You guys know I love my Wagner paint sprayers. I have a few different sprayers that I use depending on the size of project. I wrote a blog post on that linked below if you're not sure what type of sprayer to go with. This Control Pro 170 applies a consistent high quality finish on large home improvement projects such as decks, fences, exterior house siding, interior walls, and more. I've used the sprayer to stain fences and to paint the entire exterior of my parents' house and our house, and I'm excited to use it again here. This sprayer pulls paint directly out of a one or five gallon container, which means less annoying refills. The Control Pro also cuts over spray up to 55% compared to other airless paint sprayers. One of my favorite features is the incredibly light spray gun, which saves my wrists. Like I mentioned before, before, I made sure to keep a bucket of warm soapy water on hand so that if I needed to take a break or move my equipment around, I could drop the spray gun into the bucket of warm water so that the paint didn't dry up in the nozzle. I sprayed one coat of primer and one thick coat of paint. I used about two gallons of each primer and paint. Each coat only took me about 20 minutes. Like I mentioned before, the prep is a little tedious and maybe a little more time consuming, but that makes painting so much faster and more efficient and the results with a paint sprayer are so much better and more professional looking in my opinion. When using a paint sprayer, here are a few tips. Overlap each stroke by about 50%. This will ensure an even coating. Flex your wrist as you move. The gun should always remain perpendicular to the wall. The distance from the spray gun to the spray object should not exceed 18 inches. Between 10 and 12 inches is ideal. Overlap the pattern about 50%. Release the trigger at the end of each pass and start the gun in motion before pulling the trigger. We have Chantilly Lace white all throughout our house and now here in the workshop. It's a great white with no yellow or blue undertones. I wanted the workshop to feel nice and light and bright and this is a perfect white to help achieve that. The next project is installing LVP flooring. I'm going to break this project down step by step. The flooring was gifted by Florette, but it would have cost about $1,900 for a 352 square foot shed. I would say the level of difficulty for this project is easy. Let's install some flooring. Since this is a workshop, it's important that the flooring is very durable. They sent me some samples of their Modine LVP as well as their Sylvan hardwood. I loved every sample piece, but I was sold on the LVP because of its commercial grade wear layer, 
pre-attached underlayment. It is 100% waterproof and DIY friendly. Their LVP planks come in three and a half, six and nine inch widths. I decided to go with the narrow craftsman planks in the color Tilden. These planks are about three and a half inches wide and 72 inches long. They're seven millimeters thick with a 40 mil wear layer. They're also 100% waterproof and scratch resistant. Here are the tools that I used to install the flooring. I picked up this flooring installation kit, which was a must. It includes a tapping block, pull bar, and spacers. The tapping block has special grooves for this type of flooring used for tapping in the short and long ends of your planks so that they can snap into place without damaging the flooring. This pull bar is used to tap planks into place at the end of your row where there isn't room for the tapping block. This kit also came with spacers. These spacers didn't quite work for me and I'll explain why in a bit. You'll want to cut a scrap piece of flooring to bridge the gap. This piece will help align the ends of your flooring while you tap them into place. To cut the ends of the flooring, I used a miter saw. I used a jigsaw to notch out areas of the flooring and also used a table saw to rip down my last row of flooring. You could also use a utility knife to cut and snap the flooring or a multi-floor cutting tool. To prep the floors, I vacuumed them thoroughly with my shop bag. Florette recommends a 6 mil polyethylene moisture barrier on top of concrete slabs, so that's what we're putting down here. I recommend using a different product with adhesive strips on the back. I will link that product below. It lays much nicer than what we have here. I laid out a bunch of boxes of flooring so that I could have a nice range of planks to choose from, avoiding repetition. Before installing, you need to determine the direction of your planks. It's best to lay the planks parallel to the longest room dimension. It's also recommended not to install cabinets on top of floors. With the texture of the floors, you risk water leaking underneath the cabinets. It also limits expansion space. We are going to install cabinets on top of our floors anyways. It just makes the process a bit easier. And since we're starting near the doorway and ending where the cabinets will go, we don't have to worry about the last row being perfect. If the last row of your planks are going to be visible, take a measurement of your room to determine the width of the last row of planks. If the width of the last row is less than two inches, you may want to rip your first row of planks accordingly. We are working from left to right. We laid out and dry fit our first row of planks, locking the ends together by inserting inserting the tongue into the groove at an angle. It's recommended to leave a quarter inch expansion gap between the flooring and all perimeter walls or neighboring floors, so keep that in mind. Once the first row is snapped together, we pushed it against the wall. Our walls aren't perfectly square and there's a few places that we need to notch out around the doors. I took my speed square and marked out around the doors where we needed to cut the flooring. We notched those pieces out with a jigsaw and then snapped the pieces back into place. This row is now nice and square. We have spacers around the edges to keep that quarter inch expansion gap. And now we can continue on to the second row. Regarding floor layout, you'll want to stagger your joints. I'm just using the cut end of the previous row to start the new row. As long as I keep this process, all the joints will be staggered. For the following rows, I took the leftover plank from the first row, locking the long edge of the plank by angling it into the groove and then dropping it in place. Our drywall sits about a half inch off the ground and we couldn't use normal spacers or they would just fall underneath the drywall. So instead I used the corner of my speed square on each row. This left a perfect quarter inch gap every time and it prevented the flooring from sliding underneath the drywall as I tapped the ends of the flooring into place. After each new row, I 
transfer the speed square to the next. They do make special spacers for this, but I couldn't find them in stores. And I found that the speed square worked just fine. You just have to be careful when removing it to not scratch your flooring. For the next piece, I slid the end of the plank towards the end of the previously installed plank until the tongue just touched the groove. I made sure the entire long edge of the flooring was tight. And with a scrap piece of flooring, I bridged the gap of the two ends of the planks. With the tapping block and hammer, I tapped the end of the plank until the ends snapped in place. I continued this process until I reached the final plank of the row. I set a new piece in place, flipped it around, and then marked out where it needs to be cut. I cut the board down with my miter saw and then set the piece in place, again bridging the gap. This time I took the pull bar, slipped it behind the end of the plank, and then used my mallet or hammer to lock the final piece into place. Make sure that when you're measuring your final piece that you're leaving enough room for that pull bar to slide behind it. Don't forget to pull planks from different boxes so that you avoid repeating any floor patterns. Like I mentioned before, we're installing cabinets right over the flooring so this last row doesn't have to be perfect. I ended up ripping this row down an inch or so so that I could easily get the pull bar behind the flooring at the back wall. For this last row, I wasn't able to use that scrap piece to bridge the gap so Devin held the boards down while I tapped them into place. I'm going to be installing base trim which will hide all of those gaps around the perimeter. There is your tutorial on how to install LVP flooring. I hope you guys found this video helpful. In the next video, I'm installing cabinets, so stay tuned for that. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next video. In this next tutorial, we are assembling and installing cabinets. The price of this entire back wall of cabinets was about $3,500. And I would say the level of difficulty for this project is medium. Here's the tutorial on how to install cabinets. Storage is very important for the workshop, so I wanted a full wall of cabinets where I could store my tools and supplies. I'm going with a ready to assemble cabinet. I know I'm probably going to catch some flack for not building my own cabinets, but these cabinets were a great price and I just don't have the time to build my own. Devin has been helping to assemble a few cabinets here and there over the past couple of weeks. We've had cabinets scattered throughout the house, so now we just have a few left to assemble. I was going to go with IKEA cabinets. We've used them a handful of times in the past, but I found these ready to assemble cabinets and they seem much higher quality for a great price. I bought these directly from the manufacturer and unfortunately that option isn't available for everyone, but I did find a very similar shaker style cabinet by RTA and I'll link them below. I especially like the drawers. They have dovetail joinery and they feel very sturdy, which is important for all the tools and supplies that I'll be storing in here. Once all the cabinets were installed, I took all the doors off and I took all the drawers out. It's much easier to install them this way. The cabinets are assembled and now it's time for install. Here are the tools that I use to install the cabinets. You can find them linked in the description below. 
I started by taking a measurement from wall to wall. That measurement was 256, but my cabinets take up 252 inches. So that means I have four inches to play with for spacing. I have my layout and spacing figured out. The next step was to mark out the studs. I took my stud finder and my 48 inch level and marked out all the studs clearly. For the first cabinet, I knew that I had a stud at seven and three eighths of an inch and 20 and a quarter inches. So once I get this cabinet in place and all shimmed up, once I get this cabinet in place, all shimmed up level and plumb, then I can take that measurement accounting for the one inch gap at the wall and secure the cabinet into the studs at seven and three eighths and 20 and a quarter. What I should have done was leave a two inch gap at this wall, install the cabinets down the line, and then leave a two inch gap or so at the other end. Instead, I decided to space out the gaps a bit more and install the tall cabinets first because those were the toughest and then work my way towards the center. Either way, make sure to leave enough of a gap at the wall so that your cabinet doors can open fully. Since I have two studs behind the first cabinet, I'm going to secure two screws at the very top and two screws at the bottom with two and a half inch cabinet screws. This next cabinet was a bit easier to measure for the studs. I took a measurement from the end of the first cabinet to each stud, and then I transferred that measurement to the back of the cabinet. This next cabinet also had an outlet to account for, so I took the measurement for that outlet and transferred it to the back of the cabinet as well. After I transferred the measurements for the studs onto the back of the cabinet, I pre-drilled holes right away so that once the cabinet is pushed into place, I know exactly where the screws need to be secured. I used my multi-tool to cut out the back of the cabinet for the outlet. I turned off the breaker and unscrewed the outlet, then angled it so that it's easier to transfer through the cabinet. I pushed the cabinet into place, shimmed it level and plumb, and then used clamps to clamp the faces of the cabinets together nice and flush. I secured a few two and a half inch cabinet screws into the back of the cabinet into the pre-drilled holes for the studs. To secure the faces together, I pre-drilled holes and then secured two and a half inch screws. After the cabinet was secured, I took the outlet extender, slipped it around the outlet, and then secured it with the long screws provided. I followed the same steps for the two full height cabinets on the other side. One thing to keep in mind when you're measuring and marking out the studs on the back of your cabinet, the face frame overhangs the cabinet about a quarter inch, so there's a quarter inch gap in between the cabinets. So you want to make sure you're shifting that measurement a quarter inch over on the back of your cabinet as well.
After the full height cabinets were installed, I worked my way towards the center, installing the base cabinets. For each cabinet, I followed the same steps where I used shims underneath the cabinet to get the cabinet level and plumb. I secured the faces of each of the cabinets together and then secured the cabinets into the back wall. For these cabinets, if there was a gap at the back wall, I used a few shims to fill that gap and then I secured the two and a half inch screws into studs. For the last center cabinet, I made sure to center it so that the gaps were even on each side. Like I mentioned before, I wish I would have left a two inch gap at the end of each wall rather than spacing them out and leaving gaps here at the center, but this worked out just fine and once I added the filler pieces and caulk, you won't see them at all. All of the cabinets are secured, now I can install the filler pieces and trim. The cabinets came with filler boards to rip down to whatever size you needed. They also came with scribe molding to cover each of the gaps at the wall and a toe kick to nail at the bottom. I took a measurement for the gaps in the center, then cut and ripped the boards down to size. I secured the filler pieces with some clamps, pre-drilled a few holes, and then used two and a half inch cabinet screws to secure the filler pieces. At the end walls, I cut and ripped the filler pieces down to size, then I used my bread nailer to nail the filler pieces to the face frame of the cabinet. I used shims where needed to keep the filler pieces tight to the cabinet. The filler piece still left a small gap at the wall and so I nailed on that thin scribe molding to cover the gap.
For the final touches, I used some caulk to cover the seams of all of the cabinets so they truly look seamless. I also filled all of the nail holes. Last but not least, I cleaned out all the cabinets, installed the shelf pins and shelves. I installed all of the doors and drawers. I adjusted the doors and drawers so the gaps are the same all the way around and then stuck on the rubber door bumpers. The next project is a DIY countertop for under $60. The level of difficulty for this project I would say is easy and I even have a full set of project plans linked below so that makes it even easier. Let's build some countertops. I looked into butcher block countertops but that would have cost over $500 so I decided to make my own out of 2x10 pine boards for a grand total of $56. You can see the knots and the wood grain very clearly. I like the unfinished yet polished look for the workshop. It matches the pine board ceiling as well but if you don't like that look you could always go with a different type of lumber. The first thing that we did was plane all the boards down to the same thickness. I know this is a tool that not many people have, so it's okay to skip this step. You're just going to have to do a lot more sanding. If you are looking to add this tool to your workshop, I recommend this rigid planer. I will link it in the description below. After the boards were all planed down, we took them through the table saw. We ripped every board down to eight and a half inches so that the final depth of the countertop with the three boards will be 25 and a half inches. We made sure to cut off both sides of the board to get that eight and a half inches so that each edge of the board was nice and square. I cut the boards down with my miter saw to get them to the right length. I made sure to leave them long. I will make the final measurement and cut later on. So I left six inches or so on each end. The countertop is over 13 feet long, so we couldn't just use 12 foot boards, unfortunately. We had to splice them together to get the full length. With this pattern, we used one 12 foot board and four eight foot boards. We made sure to stagger the seams to make them less noticeable. We could have used 16 foot boards, but we had no way to transport them to the house but this ended up working just fine. Now that I have the boards arranged how I want them with the good face of the board facing down I marked out all the pocket holes. The outside boards will be screwed into the middle board. I used my Craig jig to pre-drill all the pocket holes. I love this Craig jig. It automatically sets the depth. I will link this in the description below. Pocket holes are drilled and now I'm going to secure the boards lengthwise first. To do this, I used a good amount of wood glue and two and a half inch pocket screws.
Now that we have our three long boards together, we can glue them up. I have a bunch of clamps here that I'm going to use. These are panel clamps from Rockler. These will force the boards flush and flat. And then I have these 48 inch clamps to clamp all the boards together. I definitely could have used more clamps for this length of countertop, but I'm just working with what I have. I glued up the edge of the first board, set it in place, and then worked down the line clamping and screwing the boards together. We came back at the end of the day and added the last board following the same steps. Definitely not perfect, but I've got my belt sander ready to fix any imperfections. The next day, we removed the clamps and brought the countertop outside for sanding. As you can see, I've got some work to do with the belt sander. I'm going to sand down these high spots and try to get this as flat as possible. I used 60 to 80 grit for this first round of sanding. Before sanding, I scraped away some of the dried wood glue. I mentioned before, a planer isn't necessary, but it will speed up the process. You'll definitely want to invest in a portable belt sander though. This thing was less than $100 and it can work magic. After everything was sanded down flat with the belt sander, I used the orbital hand sander up to 120 grit to get rid of all the sanding marks and to get the countertop nice and smooth. After everything was sanded down, I used some wood filler to fill any small seams. After that dried, I went through with 120 grit once more. Make sure to sand any exposed edges of the countertop as well. The countertop is filled and sanded. Now we can cut it down to size. I took exact measurements of the space in between the cabinets and left about a quarter inch gap in a inch 
gap on each end. With the countertop this size, I wanted to leave plenty of room so that if it is a little bit out of square, it will still fit into place. I used some scrap wood as a guide and used my circle saw to cut each end of the countertop, making sure to avoid any of the pocket screws. Next, I used my jigsaw to notch out the two front corners to fit around the face of the adjacent cabinets. Last but not least, I took my router and round over bit to round off the front edge of the countertop. You could also use a sander, but either way, it's a good idea to saw in the corners of any exposed edges. Devin helped me set the countertop in place. Fortunately, it fit on the first try. I didn't want to stain or finish the countertop in case I needed to make any final cuts or adjustments, so I'm just going to finish it in place. The countertop is in place. The whole countertop is a little warped, so we're going to need to put some weight on it while we secure it to the cabinets. Each corner of the cabinet has this corner blocking, so I drilled a small hole in each of the corner blocking and then I'll secure a inch and a quarter screw up into the blocking and into the countertop. I was able to clamp the front edge of the countertop to the cabinets, so I secured the front edge first and then Devin stood on the back edge of the countertop all the way down so I could secure the back side. The countertop is secured to the cabinets, it's nice and flat, and now we can finish it off. I decided to go with the same whitewash mixture that I did on the ceiling, one part paint and one part water. I brushed on the whitewash and then wiped it off right away with a clean rag. After the whitewash was dry, I applied three thick coats of this polyurethane. I sanded in between each coat with 220 grit sandpaper. In this last tutorial, I'll be sharing how to trim out windows, doors, and baseboards. Overall, the trim package costs about $270, and I would say the level of difficulty is easy. Let's get into some trim work. Here's the material that I'm using to trim out the windows, door, and baseboard. I will link this material and the tools that I used in the description below. For base trim, I'm using this three and a quarter inch baseboard. For the door, I'm using this three and a quarter inch door casing. And for the windows, I'm using this two and a quarter inch casing as well as one by six or one by four boards that I will rip down for the window jams. To install the trim, I'm using this brad nailer with two inch brad nails. To cut the trim, I'm using my miter saw as well as my table saw and jigsaw. I have some shims on hand in case I need to place them behind the trim or at the corners to make tight joints. Let's start with the door casing first. You'll want to trim out the doors first before doing the baseboard. Like I said, this is a workshop, so I'm just using very basic trim. I took a measurement for the two vertical pieces first. I square cut the bottom of the trim where it hits the floor, and then I made a 45 degree miter cut at the top. After these two pieces were cut, I secured them with two inch brad nails, leaving about a quarter inch reveal. I didn't nail the top of the vertical trim just yet. I want to wait until I install the horizontal piece in case I need to make any minor adjustments at the miter joints. Thank you. 
After the vertical pieces were installed, I took a measurement from long end to long end for the horizontal piece. I mitered each end of the horizontal piece and then secured it, making sure to keep that same quarter inch reveal across the top of the door jam. It's a good idea to have some shims on hand in case you need to place them behind the trim or at the corners to create a tight joint. It's best practice to glue your joints and nail them together. But like I said, this is just the workshop and any small imperfection I can fix with caulking. The door casing is finished, now let's work on the baseboard. I made a square cut where the base hits the door casing and then mitered the corner at 45 degrees where it hits the corner of the wall. For the next piece, I started with another 45 degree miter. I also mitered the opposite end. I don't have trim long enough to go the full length of the wall, so I'll have to use two pieces here. Instead of straight cutting the baseboard at the joint, I mitered that joint so that the seam is less visible. These floors are a little wavy, so there were some gaps in the baseboard and the floor. You could scribe the bottom of the baseboard so that it fits tight. You could also use some small shoe trim to hide any gaps. I didn't think the gaps were too noticeable here, so I'm leaving it as is for the workshop. Next, let's work on trimming out the windows. I'm going with a more traditional style for the window trim. There's so many different styles and trim work available. I recommend going online and finding a picture of what you like and then try to replicate it. First, I'm going to install the window jam. There's a few ways to do this. You can build the entire box first and then set it in place. I'm just going to piece it in, starting with the bottom stool piece. I have one by six boards that I'm ripping down so that the stool overhangs the window about one and a half inches. I also cut the length so that it will overhang the casing about one and a half inches as well. Now that it's ripped down, I'm setting it in front of the window and marking out where I need to notch out the corners. To notch out the corners, I'm using my jigsaw. I secured this piece with brad nails and then took measurements for the two side jam pieces. Like I said before, you could build the entire box, glue and nail the corners together, and then set the jam in place, shimming it out nice and level, but I think it's a little easier and less time consuming to do it this way. I ripped down one by four boards to fit the left, right, and top side of the window jam. I cut all the boards to length and then secured them to the window framing with two inch brad nails. We have the window jam installed. Now let's install the casing and apron pieces. I took measurements for the side casing pieces first, making sure to leave a quarter inch reveal around the window jam. I mitered the corners of the casing and then installed the casing with two inch brad nails. Once again, I didn't nail the top near the miter yet until my top casing piece is in place in case I need to make any adjustments. For the top casing piece, I took a measurement from long end to long end and mitered each of those corners. I secured the top casing piece with two inch brad nails. Like I mentioned before, best practice is to glue the miter joints and nail them together. Last but not least, let's install the bottom apron piece. I beveled each end of the apron piece 45 degrees, and then I'm going to cut a small return piece so that the trim pattern continues around the corner.
I centered the apron piece so that it lines up with the casing above and secured it with 2 inch brad nails. For my small return pieces, I glued them up and taped them in place until the wood glue dried. All of the trim work is installed, now it's time to fill nail holes, caulk, and then paint. Trim work is one of my favorite projects. I love the attention to detail. It's such a simple detail, yet it enhances the look of the entire room. If you're doing trim work anytime soon, go online and check out different styles. There's so much you can do to customize your trim and make it complement the style of your home. There you have the entire workshop build from A to Z. If you've made it this far, thank you guys so much for watching. If you found these videos helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.